Welcome to the Sensible Socialist Podcast, a podcast for the rational left. We need to unite and work together if we're all going to get through this. Sounds like socialism to me. The amount of people I see talking about socialism positively is actually staggering. Do you think, we, I mean, do you really think that, we, that a, a proletarian revolution is just around the corner in America? Grab your pitchforks and stab your mayor. Little hero Obama. He's not my hero. How heroic he does Trump. Trump. <laughs> If Bernie Sanders were president, right, and he wanted to bring the same ideas as social, for socialism into this country, don't, do you think that we would benefit? I just told you Venezuela is eating rats. But I just want people to have health care. I don't want, like... <laughs> well, Same thing Hugo Chavez. Oh my god. You people know. have, like, worms in your brain, honestly. Welcome to this episode of the Sensible Socialist Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Gustafson. And today I'll be speaking with Sensible Socialist veteran Tamil Anatha Vinayagan and a new guest, Wesam Ahmad, who's going to be joining us for the first time. You know uh, Tamil and Anatha Vinayagan from our conversation on international law. He's a lecturer in law uh, and uh, has a co- collected a couple of degrees, uh, written a book on international law, and is uh, of the critics of international law, uh, the sort of third wave or third world approach to international law and presented that perspective on our international law podcast. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Uh, Wesam Ahmad works for Al Haq. He's a Palestinian American born, raised in the US, earned a BA in political science and sociology and a JD from the Louisiana State University. He completed an LLM uh, in international human rights law from the National University of Ireland. Uh, Al Haq is an independent Palestinian human rights organization based in Ramallah, West Bank in the occupied Palestinian territories, and it was founded in 1979, devoted to documenting human rights violations of parties to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or uh, Israeli-Palestinian issues with the continual production and issuance of reports and detailed legal studies regarding the conflict. And so I was lucky enough to uh, talk to Tamil a little bit, and he was, uh, he pulled on Wesom and provides a great uh, perspective on the ground in Palestine uh, of what's going on uh, currently in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian connection, the uh, long history of colonialism in the region, and the application of international humanitarian law or the laws of war to what's going on in Gaza today. So without further ado, here's a conversation with uh, me and Temel Anavanayagin and Wesem Ahmad. Yep. You have the, the evening prayer goal there. Yeah, is that evening prayer? Yes, yes, it is. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Wesson, do you have any questions for Kevin in terms of the podcast or the session? Well, I did a quick search on uh, the the initiative and i uh, would love to hear from, from kevin uh, uh about uh, sort of uh, uh, the inspiration behind it and uh, and uh, how uh, it has evolved and uh, where you see it going and how you see it being used in terms of the this episode is that what you mean Um, <clears throat> the inter- the internet is a bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll give, some- you, I'll give you a kind of at least a little bit of like a background or something on on me too, so that you kind of know where I'm coming from. But like, um, so I got uh, involved in politics. I think the the first kind of big, obviously, wake up moment in my life was September 11th. I was, um, I was like what. 14 or 15 when that happened. Uh, and so that reoriented sort of everything. I had friends who went off and, uh, you know, fought in Afghanistan and in Iraq. I, you know, was, but I, I was pretty opposed to the thing very quick, like very early on. And that oriented my, my sort of whole political trajectory. 
sort of coming from a kind of just generally and mostly American anti-American foreign policy into criticisms mm. of uh, the sort of structure of things generally. I got acquainted with um, Marx and Engels just kind of just before I went into college. I studied um, mostly 19th century German philosophy, so Hegel, Marx, uh, Nietzsche in college. Mm-hmm. And I, I wanted and and was involved in a number of different radical left organizations, mostly socialist communist organizations, and which obviously isn't the most popular thing in the United States to be doing. Um, uh, but um, was involved in a lot of anti-war, uh, and then beginning, I think, to kind of see it switch over to a kind of pro-Bernie uh, perspective. I I went to grad school because I graduated from college in 2008, which was a difficult time to get a job when you have a philosophy degree, uh, which is always kind of difficult to get a job. Um, but... Um, the uh, I went and got a, a master's of public administration, so learning how to be a kind of good government bureaucrat, um, but was never really able to find a job in it. So I started working at law firms uh, as a, just like a, pa- a paralegal, so you know the nurse to the to the the lawyer that is um, that kind of relationship. Um, and eventually realized that if I was going to stay a paralegal, I'd be a paralegal the rest of my life, or I could, you know, in some ways make something of myself and become a lawyer. So I went to, I t- took the, the entrance exam and did decent enough to get offered a few scholarships and decided that I was going to go uh, to American University in Washington, D.C. I liked Washington, D.C., and American University um, had an international law program. And I've always been interested in kind of all things international and my whole focus on my, I also have a double majored in political science and philosophy. And my focus on that was international politics, particularly the former Soviet sort of area, but usually, but international relations generally, um, you know, the UN, uh, but usually uh, post Soviet, my, my master's thesis was on the Soviet bureaucracy and whether or not that really did change, even though there was significant changes in political structures, whether or not the bureaucracy changed, and I don't think there was much of a change, which is why you saw some of the, I would call it degeneration that happened in the Soviet Union towards a kind of uh, authoritarian bureaucratic state. But then, um, so I went to law school uh, and I knew I was going to do something international, wasn't really sure what. I've always kind of from my persuasion as a, as a Marxist, socialist, communist, interested in human rights, particularly sort of pro-human rights of, of not just like non-interference by the government in terms of right to free speech or something, but the actual affirmative uh, obligations of states to provide housing and the decent, you know, education, healthcare, the things that we are not necessarily always provided for in the United States to uh, international consternation. And so uh, I figured um, I would study international human rights. And then uh, as part of that, though, I've always, uh, my my grandfather was in the military. Uh, my great grandfather was in the military, come from a kind of military background. And I've always been kind of fascinated by conflict in terms of it just being this like crazy human action that we can take that really puts human beings kind of on the edge, on the knife edge of like life's existence. And it's a, it's just this crazy thing that musters all of these different resources and needs all of this kind of attention. And so I, um, I was interested in also seeing that as some of the most dangerous and horrific things that human beings do to each other and thinking if I'm going to go to law school, I want to try to do not the most for me, which is I think a lot of what people go to law school for, but to go to law school to try to help the worst off. And if I look around, I think the worst off people in the world are essentially civilians caught in the midst of conflict. And so my focus really shifted to international humanitarian law um, and uh, hope like basically wanting to put myself on a, the trajectory to be in the prosecutor's office at the ICT uh, the, or the ICC or the ICTY or some kind of um, justice mechanism in order to actually like begin to try to push against what I see as the big fault of uh, international law generally is there being no real enforcement mechanism of a lot of things that it's this kind of like gentleman's handshake agreement that, yep, we're going to do all these things. And there's not really a lot of teeth in international law. 
But there is in international criminal law to at least the degrees that you can find someone guilty of a crime and and put them in jail. And so that mm. was to me, it's like, I, I would be really frustrated to work in international law knowing that I wasn't going to, there, there's no court that can sentence you to anything in terms of the mm. International Court of Justice or something like that. And so I wanted mm. to work in international, like international criminal law, prosecute war criminals. And, you know, I got to see a couple of days of the Milotic trial at the ICTY when I was in The Hague and stuff like that. And that was like energizing. It was just like, yeah, you want to see pieces of shit like that go down, you know? And I think that that, that was what, that was a big motivating thing for me. And so I tried getting into the, into the, the court and um, it's really difficult, particularly as an American, we're not, you know, a state party and all those kind of things. And, and, you know, I think another, white relatively privileged dude from the united states is not totally what the court is looking for in terms of its its uh at least aesthetic dynamics and so it was yeah. obviously difficult for me to get into the field unless i thought about you know getting an llm at leiden or going you know for a phd somewhere outside of the u.s honestly like you know and that was difficult and i had a life and then now i've got a kid and all sorts of things and so it's it's kind of um, my ability to affect change in terms of at least the perspective of international law is really small, but I'm trying to do what I can do. And part of that um, uh, is like, I have a diverse set of interests in terms of my political views. They go from, you know, very small in terms of how should we organize workplaces to very large in terms of how should international relations be conducted and and what you know are the things about the current international re legal regime that I would want to keep and what would I want to throw away and and mm. um, how can I use the information and knowledge I kind of have to be able to at least speak intelligently to frankly people that don't always speak intelligently about these kind of things and I think for me so my podcast is the subtitle of the podcast is a podcast for the rational left because I do think that there's a part of the left that's fairly kind of irrational and doesn't as often kind of a caricature of itself and of some of the word like the lamest elements of, of the the left and so i want to be a bit of a pushback against that in the sense that you can have a critical leftist perspective that can also be well informed by a kind of academic understanding of legal principles and le internet you know historical dynamics and all these kind of stuff but also speak to them and present them in a way that isn't so jargon laden and specific to people who already have that perspective that you're not communicating to the larger people who are interested enough in the topic to want to sit down and listen to a conversation. And so at least my goal, my initial goal, like reaching out, I mean, Tamil reached out to me and said, you know, we should have an episode on international law and international relations. And I was like, yeah, I've been thinking about that for a long time, but like, I don't always, like as much as I'm talking a lot right now, I don't like the sound of my own voice. And so I wanted to have somewhat of a conversation. Um, and, um, and so that was, I think one of the better conversations that we've had on the po podcast that, that, it, that does toe that line to be able to like speak intelligently about an important subject, but also speak about it in a way that's accessible to people who would be interested in listening to it. And so I think, Right now, obviously, there's lots of attention on what's going on in Gaza in particular, and there's a lot of commentary on it. And I think that they're, like that's obviously good and important. Um, I think there's a lot of people for whom I agree with in terms of their general perspective, but who, um, who I don't think have the greatest way of presenting it or maybe the most informed opinions. And so I want to add voices to this conversation that are, you know, I think sufficiently, and I'll, I'll be kind of frank, my bias is towards um, the struggle of the Palestinian people. Um, but from the perspective of saying that the struggle of the Palestinian people is not abstracted from responsibilities to abide by the laws of war and, and different things like that. And so, talking about important questions like um you know uh is hey um do you see me yeah we can see you now yeah, yeah, you froze right, for okay, a second okay. there but now you're back um and so like like in a way of kind of introducing it i think that this has been in the news a lot and um we've seen a lot of like for me crazy things i mean watching 
13 or 14 story apartment buildings be leveled because some rockets were fired from the top of it is just sort of outrageous to me. And I think when I look at it, even from having this perspective of a background in international humanitarian law, it's just so flagrantly violating norms and principles that I, that, that I agree with and really want to defend. I think international humanitarian law in particular is this nice place in terms of having a good structure to be able to really understand what duties and obligations there would be to in some ways be able to conduct some kind of conflict, but to do so with the least problematic um, results. And I think what's happening in Gaza right now is a violation of those basic principles and norms. And I want to be able to kind of explain that in a way that um, there's two sides of it. One, there's this kind of disassociated legalistic, let's just kind of look at the facts and put it all together and make the arguments. And I think that that's important to do. We need to be able to do that. But I want to be able to do that after kind of understanding the human cost of all of this and like the fact that these are, I just think that in in times of conflict, we often, for sometimes understandable reasons, dehumanize participants in the conflict, even ourselves, but certainly the people for whom we're, you know, engaged against. And I think that we're all human beings and we all have loves and desires and passions and friends and communities and, and you know, spiritual engagements and social engagements. And we're all engaged in these pro- projects that when I see buildings being toppled and children being killed, it, it, um, it just sort of you know, it really hurts. It it really hits me in that that genuine empathy for all human beings bone. And I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of it if we do have a more kind of head in the clouds discussion of the legal implications of this, because I think that it's it's just sort of important to recognize the human sort of costs of this. And so I would just, I guess, throw it to you, either either one of you, Tamil or, or Wessam, just sort of the the human aspect of what's going on in Palestine right now and kind of what it, what it means. How do you feel about that? Russell, do you go on first? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for uh, the insight uh, into your background, Kevin. Uh, that definitely helps uh, to understand the, uh, uh, that uh, we aren't speaking simply on a podcast. We're speaking with people, and the, the people behind the podcast are uh, people that uh, have gone through a life experience to get to the point to create the podcast. And I, I think uh, all of this uh, plays a role uh, in uh, understanding, uh, you know, how we have come to where we are and what it is that we can do within this seemingly. Uh, overwhelming uh, system of complexity uh, of different actors uh, engaged in uh, different actions in different parts of the world and how uh, uh, we can uh, reconcile uh, the, the, the meta uh, nature of uh, that, uh, that situation and our own uh, role as individuals. And I uh, commend you for taking the initiative to, to develop the podcast and open up a space uh, for discussion uh, on this issue. Yeah. Um, as uh, you know, the, the human element for me is also very important. Uh, as a Palestinian American born and raised in the U.S., um, actually not too far away from uh, where you studied at American University, um, uh, and uh, and coming to Palestine because my parents are both uh, uh, were born here in uh, in Palestine, um, and uh, and always being aware of the connection between uh, uh, the Palestinian struggle, uh, even though I was uh, living in the uh, comforts of, uh, of the U.S. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it very similar to sort of uh, what you described as your uh, uh, awakening of, uh, of an understanding and appreciation of your role within the world, uh, very much also uh, 9-11 uh, played a, a significant uh, role in shaping my worldview as well and, and shaping my view uh, of how uh, I uh, um, saw myself uh, and how others saw me uh, within uh, the U.S. And uh, it definitely had a, a big impact on, uh, on 
my uh, my perception of the world and and my connection to it and and how others uh, also uh, are connected and so uh, that was part of uh, you know the the reason i uh, went to to law school to to understand uh, how it is that uh, we can uh, better address uh, the issues of uh, of injustice in a in a holistic manner and uh, i have always been driven by passion and going coming to palestine uh, was part of that uh, um, exploratory uh, um, cycle of life uh, to understand uh, what role you can play and where you can play it and uh, i see uh, within the palestinian context that uh, that is very much for me um, a continuing process um, but going back to your uh, specific uh, question uh, with regard to the the human dimension within uh, uh, our current uh, cycle of violence um, for me as a palestinian it is uh, important to frame uh, our situation uh, within a broader context always because uh, it is very easy to get lost in the the forest for the trees and see uh, the the current situation as simply a, a part of a new cycle that needs to be addressed and we need to be very cautious uh, about this uh, because we don't want uh, uh, the world to simply see this as just another blip on the radar and it'll eventually go away it has to be seen within the broader context and that context is a is a broader colonial process uh, that uh, has been ongoing and continues and if we don't put that perspective, uh, the attention that is being given to Palestine uh, now uh, will be a lost opportunity if we don't uh, take the opportunity to put people within the broader perspective. And I think even the, the most uh, nuanced things like the, the title of the framing of the discussion uh, using the, the title that the Israeli uh, occupation forces have given it, um, is part of the uh, the little things that we can do in how we frame it. Uh, um, you know, perhaps uh, your your use of the title was a way to draw uh, uh, attention to the issue, which I can understand as well because we have to take that uh, into consideration. Uh, but uh, you know, the part of uh, again the, the Israeli side also takes this into consideration in framing it and trying to put it in a defensive posture about uh, what it is doing yep. uh, but the reality is what is it that it is trying to defend what it is it that it is trying to secure it is a colonial enterprise that it is trying to maintain and continue uh, to sustain and so for us we we see the pain we see the suffering on a continuous uh, basis but uh, in order for that pain to mean something and to resonate it has to reach the minds of the people that care to understand what is happening within the broader context and so as obviously everyone is going to see it even palestinians are going to see it uh, in different ways in different perspectives but for me um, considering my background as a palestinian american i want to see uh, the the palestinian people enjoy uh, the, um, the the right to uh, uh, live in, in dignity and freedom and per enjoy the pursuit of happiness uh, that uh, I uh, grew up uh, in the US uh, seeing as uh, uh, very important values that uh, that all human beings should enjoy. Uh, the reality on the ground is not uh, such, but uh, it is going to take uh, human beings and their actions uh, to try to make that uh, a reality. Yeah. You're in you're in Palestine now? Yes, yes, I'm in Ramallah. Wow. That's quite the time to be there. Of course all the time is quite the time to be in Palestine, I suppose. It never ends. Yeah, yeah, I've been here since 2006 actually. So, um I've uh, seen uh, numerous uh, cycles uh, of these uh escalations and hostilities if we want to use the uh, framing of uh, the the legal frameworks and, and ihl but again uh, even those frameworks of uh, international law can be a part of the 
a problem in uh, trying to isolate and compartmentalize uh, and not see uh, uh, the situation in its totality. Tamil, I cut you off. Sorry. No, um, no, I just, I just wanted to echo um, what, what I mean, where some said. I mean, and and you know, uh, answer your question there uh, as well. Um, uh, I mean, looking at what is happening right now in Palestine slash Israel, um. It is, you know, for me, I mean, I, w I, w I was born, raised in Germany. Um, so, uh, so uh, you know, looking at what is happening um, is, is of a special importance. F for me as a German, looking at, you know, demonstrations that are happening in, in, in Germany where Israeli flags are burned down, synagogues are attacked is in you know i cannot accept that at all i mean I, i've been socialized by you know i wouldn't say by guilt but but i would say by the you know awareness what the germans did to the jewish people okay that's something that you know i cannot ignore uh so the shoah is very real to me um but on the other hand i'm a, I'm, I'm a tamil as well so i i have these dual role that I'm playing. I, I am a German uh, who's aware of his special responsibility to, towards Jewish people. But I am also fully aware as a Tamil what the Palestinian peoples are going through, right? Land grabbing, um, you know, deprivation of livelihoods, um, bombardments of uh, civilian areas. Um, that is something that's very real to me. And when I see Palestinian women, children, men uh, crying, running for their lives. I see my family, I see my relatives exactly in that very moment because I know how many relatives I lost, okay, in, in the 26 years that lasted in Sri Lanka from 1983 to 2009. So when I see the struggle of the Palestinians, it's the shared struggle of the wretched of the global south. Um, if you want to put it the way of Franz Fanon, uh, against, and as, as Wessom said be beautifully, I mean, we have to see in the larger context, which is colonialism. It's an ongoing form of colonialism that is perpetrated upon us. And we should never forget Gaza, which is currently, as we speak, bombarded, is one of the probably most densely populated areas in the world. Okay, it's one of the mostly dense populated areas in the world. And what I found appalling, Kevin, was the fact that, <clears throat> sorry, it's not only the fact that, um, you know, this whole situation erupted towards the end of Ramadan. It's moreover that we're in the midst of a pandemic. Okay, we're in the midst of the pandemic when uh, Sheikh Jarrah was you know, evacuated and people, you know, and people living there were evicted, which led up to the situation right now. And third and most importantly, which is also very important, I think, as a, as a factor to consider in the larger context of our discussion, Benjamin Netanyahu is fighting for his survival in office as prime minister. Yeah. So there was an opportune situation for him to show that he's a strongman and ev evict people who have lived all their life in Sheikh Jarrah, leading up to the situation, and now bombard uh, Gaza. Um, and, you know, f for the listeners, perhaps, um, I mean, the fundamental principles of IHL are the distinction uh, between civilians and combatants, the prohibition to attack um, peoples who are not directly engaged in hostilities, to prohibit unnecessary su suffering, the principle, of, uh, the, uh, principle of necessity has to be respected. And finally, the principle of proportionality. And if you're looking at uh, leveling, <laughs> it's not only leveling, you know, buildings of Al Jazeera and Associated Press. They are attacking civilian areas. And the argument there is we have a psychological trauma that bombs are falling upon us in Tel Aviv. And Hamas is hiding in the midst of the civilians. And I think to myself, listen, IHL has a purpose. It's structured as a law under international law. 
and it should preserve the lives of civilians. And what you're doing right now is just a justification to wipe out the Palestinians and further a hegemonic um, policy. That's my view. Yeah, so I think <clears throat> like the the it, it, we're all kind of on the same page in terms of this larger view of of understanding what's going on in the kind of principle or the the prism of colonialism, and I I think because there's a I live in America, right, and I, and I, you know, West, I think you're going to connect with this too, in the sense of like the position of Israel uh, in the United States has a kind of shame aspect somewhat like you were talking about Tamil but it also it has this like religious context in terms of the there's a definitely this kind of Christian and certainly a, like apocalyptic Christian perspective that's like looking at the Middle East to see if there's signs of like the second coming of Christ and some of these like pretty I would call them sort of out there ideas but then um but there's obviously just the the well understood US foreign policy perspective of like we support Israel no matter what it's there are ally in the Middle East you know you hear all these the only democracy in the Middle East and some of these kinds of like explanations as to why Israel is right and I think there's also a pretty implicit understanding that like look at who lives in Israel uh and and look at who lives in Palestine they look they look more like Americans and I think there's honestly a connectivity that a lot of your sort of quote unquote average American has with like well you know, one, God said that they can live there. And, you know, the very simplistic, that's that God said they can live there. And two, um, they look like us and talk like they talk English and stuff. And so like, they're, yeah, they're just more like us. So of course we support them. I think there's this, this like common notion. I want to, I want to push back against sort of all of it. And, and the difficulty for me is that to really understand what's going on today in Gaza, which, you know, you have really do have to go back to like, the beginnings of human civilization and, and understand that like the Middle East generally and particularly the Mediterranean coast has this like very long and complex history of being part of the larger fertile civilization, the first civilizations that develop, then the, then a sort of immediate beginning of this, this like history of colonialization after colonialization. So like there's an indigenous group of people there. Then at least in terms of the mythic Judaic civilizational story, there's an incursion from Egypt by God's chosen people. And, and then a number of conflicts that involve, you know, ethnic cleansings and genocide and some not great things that then kind of give the, 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 the people the ability to claim, you know, the ownership of it. Then there's a conquest, you know, from Rome. There's a conquest of um, the sort of of the Islamic, you know, caliphate generally in terms of this move. There's this this on top of each other, on top of each other colonialization process that you can understand in the wider history of like why it's important in terms of the development of Abrahamic religions, and you can get really deep into like any of these kind of in some ways tangents. But if you look at it from this colonial perspective. The it is this colony after colony after colony, oppression upon oppression upon oppression of like different groups of people who occupy it at different times. And but I think the, mo the most effective are just that's like a very basic background of a very complex history that brings you up to the, the sort of modern colonization period that gets us into the development of the modern nation state, the, the, the ability to um, do this kind of primitive accumulation that ends up allowing the, the modern industrial capitalist system to develop. And then that, that reorientation from the more mercantilist, you know, settler colonialist that you experience in the Americas um, and more just like ex resource extraction in places like India and Africa and the Middle East into this imperial project of like conquest for for wealth for wealth extraction, the dividing up of um, Africa and the Middle East into modern nation states that don't correspond to boundaries that people understand or really totally make sense, because um, all of that is kind of necessary to understand how you even get the, the sort of modern nation state of Israel, right? So there is this long process that I obviously you could spend, we could have an entire podcast devoted to like the history of Israel-Palestine pre-Palestine 
1917 or something and it could la- and we could do it for years right so this is like an entire very complex and very like shortened version of this kind of thing but i think it it has to be understand that that the people in palestine even the, the in palestine were colonized people um were already sort of under a a league of nations mandate system that allowed a different group of people to make laws for the people who lived in Palestine at the time. And that this basic, basic fact of, that we can like sort of start with in terms of the modern Israeli-Palestinian conflict rests on the already existent phenomenon of colonialism, and, and particularly in that area. And it is only through the vehicle of having Britain, in some ways, having this mandate that you're even able to construct this process of the development of the state of israel and i think unlike a lot of other places the the process of the development of the state of israel is so unique that without understanding its tie to colonialism like of not even of the israeli type that kind of comes second order but of the sort of british and european style so i don't know if um uh you like either either tamil or wesson you guys want to sort of I, I guess paint that picture a little bit um, in a way that it makes sure that there, that this perspective is important as it leads into understanding what Israel's actual sort of perspectives, policies, goals, and that kind of stuff are vis-a-vis uh, the Palestinians. I think Wesson should go first um, in, in this regard. I mean, he has researched a lot on this, so Wesson should go first, I believe. Yeah. Thank you, Tamil, and uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, you've uh, you've touched on uh, sort of the again the the historical uh, background, and uh, depending on which point uh, in time you start, uh, the everything changes uh, in terms of trajectory and, and the narrative. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, you know this takes us to really you know the initial uh, sort of premise of uh, the discussion is uh, uh, the development of international law, specifically international humanitarian law. And, and if we look at the, the evolution of humanity um, in parallel to the evolution of how human beings engage with one another and regulated that behavior as societies interacted more and more, we come to a point where it is that uh, sort of uh, uh, conflict uh, between peoples uh, that uh, led us to uh, uh, where we are now in terms of international humanitarian law regulating uh, conflict, uh, and uh, and from the Palestinian within the Palestinian context, uh, um, you know we understand the history of uh, of colonialism in a broader sense, um, but uh, also uh, you know it takes a unique uh, form uh, within uh, within our context uh, as well in terms of as you said the development of uh, the British mandate uh, um, after World War One. Um, that was at the time even criticized by uh, the U.S. as uh, seeing it as just a, a way for the British to try to preserve their empire. And at the time, the U.S. was uh, more anti-imperial uh, than uh, it is now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and so that uh, you know played a role in the dynamics of, uh, uh, of pre World War II and uh, part of the reason uh, uh, that. That led to the U.S. Uh, not actually uh, being part of the the League of Nations, um, but uh, uh, if uh, I, I like to use uh, the the words of uh, the the Israelis themselves uh, in describing the situation whenever possible, because it makes uh, things uh, uh, you know much uh, clearer and uh, eliminate the, the attacks of uh, cognitive bias that uh, might emerge. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially within uh, this context and uh, and my particular background. And I always like to start with uh, the opinion from the legal advisor uh, of uh, the Israeli government uh, at the time in 1967, uh, when immediately after the uh, occupation of Palestinian territory post-1967, the discussion of uh, uh, the continuation of the colonization of Palestine and the development of the settlement enterprise uh, was on the table. And uh, the legal advisor at the time, this is a well-known uh, opinion from Theodore Morin, uh, who uh, said, uh, from the point of view of international law, the, cre- the key provision is the one that appears in the last paragraph of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Israel, of course, is a party to this convention. The paragraph stipulates as follows. 
the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of a civilian population into the territory it occupies. And then he went on to elaborate and show how the commentary of the Fort Geneva Convention prepared by the International Committee of the Red Cross stated that it was intended to prevent a practice adopted during World War II by certain powers which transferred portions of their own population to occupied territory for political or racial reasons or in order, as they claimed, to colonize those territories. And such transfers worsened the economic situation of the native population and endangered their separate existence as race. This is a is a clear indication of how uh, um, a legally minded person saw uh, Israel's motives at the time. So the law was pretty clear. Uh, yes, uh, colonialism might have been a practice uh, of the past, but it the the law has evolved and part of the evolution of international relations that colonialism would no longer be acceptable practice in international relations but israel chose to carve out an exception for itself and found allies willing to support it in that uh by a convergence of interests um you know let's not forget uh at the time, it was the, the British uh, desire to maintain uh, uh, um, uh, their uh, remnants of an empire prior uh, to World War I and during uh, the mandate, uh, but uh, also, uh, you know, in, uh, during the, the Cold War and uh, the U.S. interest uh, in the region, and uh, there's very much a geopolitical uh, interest and dynamics uh, at play as well. Um, not to uh, dismiss uh, the U.S.'s own uh, settler colonial history and uh, the, the challenges that that might pose uh, in uh, directly uh, uh, criticizing uh, um, what might appear uh, from the U.S. perspective as just simply being uh, their history repeated in a different, uh, but looking at it at a different uh, scope of time within that process. Um, but you know, this is the point that international law, uh, if we look at the international community of states and, and peoples and how they viewed the relationship between one another, the idea was colonialism is not a practice that uh, is going to be accepted. And even with the, um, the, the exceptions that the Israel tries to use uh, today uh, with regard to uh, uh, religious connections and, and uh, historical entitlement, uh, you know, the, there was no uh, exception carved out uh, for those that uh, viewed their uh, entitlement to conquest as being religiously based. Uh, that's because uh, imperialism and colonialism was based in a large part on some sense of uh, religious uh, entitlement uh, to be able to conquer and civilize and um, it isn't just colonialism, slavery as well. Um, um, you know, in the U.S., uh, you, uh, I'm sure, have heard uh, or, uh, of, uh, of uh, slave owners uh, reading uh, scripture to uh, their, uh, their slaves in order to uh, also try to uh, justify uh, their bondage. Um, and so uh, if we look at human evolution as a process of uh, uh, evolving in a positive sense, then it is the realization of how we see one another and how we should treat one another. And that development of international humanitarian law is part of that process. And international humanitarian law serves a purpose to prevent this practice of, uh, of colonialism. Uh, but Israel has chosen to uh, uh, ignore this and uh, navigate uh, the law in a way that it wants to interpret, uh, despite how the rest of the, the world uh, interprets it. And so long as there are interests uh, that benefit from Israel's uh, um, strategic uh, support uh, within the region, then it becomes easy for Israel to exploit that relationship and push uh, the the boundaries and we see it playing out right now very clearly where you know the majority of the UN Security Council members wanted to meet uh, on Friday and the US uh, uh, wanted to push it back to Tuesday well yeah in you know the big scheme of meetings 
a Friday me meeting or a Tuesday meeting doesn't uh, uh, mean much. But when you are talking about uh, civilians being bombarded on the ground and every day and every hour people losing their lives, Friday to Tuesday makes a big difference. And when it is a superpower that allows uh, Israel to uh, take uh, these uh, additional few days uh, to uh, uh, tick off its uh, its target list and uh, and uh, achieve a particular uh, um, uh, strategic advantage, um, you know the the that is part of uh, of the problem in how uh, the the U.S. sees Israel and its actions, and also how Israel. Uh, sees its relationship with the U.S. and how it can exploit uh, that relationship and exploit uh, similar relationships and historical injustices from uh, Germany and uh, and likewise. So it's uh, it's very much an interconnected uh, process that Israel has uh, studied uh, very well and continues to uh, refine and exploit. And the victims are uh, the the people that die through this continuous cycle of violence uh, um, in trying to preserve. Uh, and pursue these colonial ambitions. If, if I may add to what uh, Wesson just said, I think, um, you know, the, the former leader um, of the Palestinians, uh, Yasser Arafat, said in his maiden speech uh, in 1974 before the United Nations uh, in New York, uh, the following words, uh, and it, I mean, it, it follows up basically on what uh, Wesson said, uh, he said the roots of the Palestinian question reach back into the closing years of the 19th century. Uh, in other words, uh, to that period we call the era of colonialism and settlement as we know it today. This period persists into the present. Marked evidence of its totally reprehensible presence can be readily, uh, readily sorry, uh, perceived in the racism practiced both in South Africa and Palestine. Um, I, I just attended uh, this week um, a conference which was not organized in light of the, uh, the, the situation right now in Palestine at um, an institution in the UK. I, I'm not allowed to give too much more information. It was a conference on apartheid um, and we had to deal with it under Chatham uh, rules. So it's uh, highly confidential. Um, but so uh, I don't want to expose too much information. Uh, but what happened there was we talked about apartheid, and obviously we targeted the d discussion around um, around Israel as well. Obviously, and it more or less builds on your question there earlier as well, Kevin, and echoes what Wesam said. Uh, you know, Alexandre Ocasio-Cortez, I think either yesterday evening or this morning, she tweeted, democracies cannot be apartheid. I think that she, I think that's what she tweeted. And she received a lot of backlash about it. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, speaking there with the words of Wesson, what we are seeing is a continuation of colonialism that has translated into settler colonialism. And with the words of the famous uh, Israeli academic, Oren Yiftachel, um, you know, what we are seeing in Israel right now is an ethnocracy. It's not a democracy. It's an ethnocracy. It's an ethnic um, Jewish state that just tolerates at best the Palestinians in on its territory. And even when I saw yesterday on, on Al Jazeera, uh, there was a press conference of Benjamin Netanyahu aired, he said, um, we are a Jewish state and we cannot uh, allow any attacks against Jewish settlers. Uh, but we will also not allow any attacks against the Arabs who are permitted to stay. That was his words yesterday. So I think to myself, we are seeing the settler colonialism that feeds, that, that reaps the benefits of, um, you know, uh, the occupied territories more and more day by day. Um, and uh, West Ham's research is very much on, you know, the exploitation of natural resource, and al Haq has written extensively about it, how capitalism actually sustains colonialism in the occupied territories. And we should not forget about it, how, you know, the, the, the people in Gaza have, don't have access to the natural resources. They are under uh, a naval blockade, 
Um, although officially Gaza is not occupied anymore, but the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, has said himself, um, you don't need to have boots on the ground to occupy an area. Israel has the sophisticated technology to occupy still without having boots on the ground. So Gaza is re re reliant on, you know, energy resources coming from um, Israel, where and at the same time, Israel is ex exploiting all the natural resources that belong to the people under a severe violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. So the Fourth Geneva Convention is basically more or less our Bible of a conversation, if we want, under international law and IHL, which was repeated moreover by... Uh, and with this, I will, you know, finish my section now uh, of, the, of the, my comment, uh, was which was repeated by the 2004 advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. Israel has an obligation as an occupying force since 1967 towards the Palestinian people. And since Israel has signed up also to human rights treaties, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, abbreviated, or the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, their obligations extend to the occupying territories. And the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, has repeatedly said, you're violating this. You're violating the rights of the Palestinians to live a dignified life. And the reason is um, expansion of colonialism, and perhaps I can talk at a later stage about that, the three phases of you know, expansion of colonialism in the occupied territories. And perhaps, I mean, hopefully, you know, Western will also talk about that in a more expanded fashion. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, the, the I remember very much in, in law school when I'm studying international humanitarian law and things like that, of, of having to go through kind of the steps, you know, and if you say, okay, the first question always is, does IHL apply? In, in this situation, right? And so like if we if we even start that kind of routine and we say, okay, if we look at today, um, does IHL apply? Now, for those of us who are familiar enough with international humanitarian law, it's it's a very clear yes. There, there would be two grounds in my view that there would obviously be IHL applying today in the ground on Gaza, which is there's active hostilities. So there is conflict going on between an armed group and another armed group that is sufficient at least to apply some aspect of, of inter international humanitarian law. Um, we can have just, you know, it uh, is obviously of a non-international character, but, um, but the other one is, and I think as we've discussed, a situation of occupation. If there is a situation of occupation, IHL applies. Um, and so I, I want to kind of, I would like just to make sure that we dispense with this quickly. The, um, I have heard the argument in, in discussing with people who are more on the sort of pro-Israeli side of s essentially suggesting that there is no occupation uh, of, of Palestine um, based on a couple ideas. One, Palestine was never officially a state, therefore it isn't, doesn't have territory on which it can be occupied. Um, two, like you said, Gaza does not, I mean, we've done, you've essentially done away with this already, but that there are, that there was a former occupation in Gaza, there no longer is. And one might say the same thing about the West Bank. Um, and then, uh, and then um, I think, well, those are the two big ones, at least I can think of is essentially, there isn't the sufficient control over, over Gaza. Like there's not, that is if you control all the day-to-day -day activities of what's going on or the government, right? They do have technically their own like elected and organized government. Um, so, just to kind of dispense with these, uh, like, uh, you know, e either one of you guys, Wes, I'm going to be curious to just kind of like, um, is is there not a situation of occupant occupation because Palestine isn't a state? The question of state, right? I think, I don't know if you guys saw this, but there was the question of, we'll get to this too, but there was the questioning of a, of a Biden administration official in terms of the, the position of the Biden administration is that Israel has the right to self-defense in terms of its engagement. And so there was obviously the question of whether or not the Palestinians have the right to self-defense. And of course, they, they used an interesting language in describing that by saying that the right of self-defense is the right of any state, which of course then brings up the whole question, which is a major hot debate within international law. If you want to debate about it, I think it's relatively clear that 
I mean, to be honest with you, I would just kind of put the stake down and saying I think there's sufficient evidence to say that Palestine is a state such that it such that international law should apply. Um, it's a you know it's a it's it's some member of the United Nations General Assembly. It's been able to accede to tr- treaties. Most importantly, the Rome Statutes. So I I just think um, that's fairly well established. But um, I would be curious, Wes, somehow you would reply to the argument that there's no occupation because there's no state. Yeah, I, I'm very familiar with the argument uh, that there's no occupation because there's no state and there's no state because we won't let you be a state and want you to continue uh, to uh, to live under occupation. And uh, in the end, uh, you know, this goes to the, the, the fact that international law uh, operates within a context of uh, um, politics and power politics and those with the power dictate how the law is applied, interpreted and enforced. And that's where the weakness of the international system uh, um, exists in, uh, in how international law is applied in selective ways. And uh, uh, we might uh, you know, look at uh, something like uh, the, the International Criminal Court as a pinnacle of uh, evolution of uh, international laws, uh, uh, universal application. But then when you go down into the details of its application um, uh, and, the, and the individual people and even to the level of the color of their skin, uh, then you start uh, seeing uh, that uh, the words on paper uh, um, don't mean much uh, um, when it comes to uh, those with the power. And so uh, from uh, our perspective, uh, um, we see, you know, there is a consensus within the interpretation of international law. And that consensus, I would think, uh, not only comes from legal interpretation, but uh, um, an attempt to uh, look at things in an objective manner. And I I think uh, that comes, uh, you know, in, in uh, to fruition uh, when you see uh, the last uh, UN General Assembly resolution that uh, upgraded uh, the status of Palestine uh, to an observer state, not a full member state, but uh, uh, how the international community views it. So, you know, uh, you know touching on the um, uh, uh, issue of, uh, of the role of capitalism and, uh, and uh, what is it that uh, uh, is the monetary uh, currency of uh, exchange, um, you know, it is what uh, people choose to uh, give it and who has the ability to uh, enforce uh, that uh, value system. And, uh, and that also applies uh, within the context of international law. Um, I think the, the question uh, should be uh, put on the, those that are trying to deny the Palestinian benefit uh, of uh, international law and ask why. What is it that you are trying to achieve by denying the Palestinians their right to self-determination? And that leads to the bigger question that their desire is to eliminate the Palestinian uh, uh, basis uh, for a state and fulfill a continuing process of settler colonialism. And this is the distinction between settler colonialism uh, um, and other forms of uh, colonialism that you alluded to that uh, were very much uh, 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 focused on the extraction of uh, of resources rather than settling a population. Um, The the settler colonial uh, uh, component uh, involves uh, replacing uh, the people, uh, the indigenous population on the territory. And so uh, this is where the, the fundamental problem uh, needs to be addressed. And uh, I you know, appreciate the value of international law, but I also recognize its weakness and its uh, origins and uh, how the law can be used and abused. Uh, there's a reason why uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, um, uh, has uh, very little relevance uh, within uh, U.S. Uh, domestic law, uh, but the tax code uh, is uh, very much uh, 
uh, a key uh, tool in uh, um, the ability to continue to uh, uh, um, consolidate and accumulate wealth. Um, and so uh, let's not uh, um, lose sight of, uh, you know, you don't need to be a lawyer to look at uh, something uh, objective on your TV screen uh, today and, uh, and appreciate uh, what's right and wrong. Um, unfortunately, sometimes uh, what is legal uh, is also wrong, uh, but that doesn't make it right. Uh, and so uh, I think, uh, you know, these arguments that are put forward, um, in the end, who's putting them forward? Um, it is a very select uh, uh, representation of the international community in, uh, in a quantitative sense. Uh, but in terms of uh, the uh, qualitative uh, um, uh, um, power balance, uh, uh, that's uh, where the, the problem lies. And so if we want to see international law uh, truly evolve um, and it be a rule-based system, not one that uh, might makes right, uh, then the Palestinian uh, issue is a test. It's a test for uh, this progressive narrative of the evolution of international law and whether or not it's real or it's simply a myth that has been uh, projected to continue uh, advancing the exploitation of, uh, of peoples of the world um, in different ways uh, and under the, the guise of uh, um, uh, love, peace and happiness. So if, if I may, you know, um, rein in here, um, I mean, international humanitarian law is one of my areas of research. Um, looking at international human uh, humanitarian law from the orbit, um, there are two types of conflict for, you know, the listeners and the, and the viewers. First, um, we have an international armed conflict under um, uh, the, the valid rules, which is abbreviated as IAC, um, International Armed Conflict, which is a conflict between uh, two or more high contracting state parties of the Geneva Conventions. And the Geneva Conventions uh, from 1949, uh, additionally to uh, the additional uh, protocols from 1977, are considered to be widely customer international law. I don't want to, you know, start with a public international international humanitarian law lecture here, but right. let, let's leave it there. EP2 and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's let's leave it there. Let's leave it there. And then we have a NIAC, which is a non-international armed conflict, non-international conflict. How it is triggered? Well, it is about a conflict between one or more non-international uh, armed groups. Um, and it is triggered um, by, um, uh, um, and th there are two dominating uh, thresholds that have to be met according to the International Court of uh, the Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia. In the Tadic case, namely, uh, the first threshold is there needs to be uh, violence that goes mere be beyond like normal riots. But then, you know, there has to be an organization on the side of um, the non-international armed group, okay? The complexities now for our conflict um, in Palestine is that, you know, first of all, there has been a takeover um, of the Palestinian territory um, from another occupying power, namely uh, Jordan and Egypt in 1967, the illegal annexation of East Jerusalem, and then also the designation of some authority to the uh, Palestinian authorities according to the Oslo Accords, and finally, the so and what I mentioned earlier, and you picked up on it as well, the Gaza disengagement, so-called, uh, in 2005 under Ariel Sharon. Um, and he was, you know, I don't want to be polemic right now, but he was praised for that. Um, but the fact, the matter of the fact is numerous, and I, that's the reason why I'm looking at, at my uh, other screen here, numerous UN Security Council resolutions, namely the UN Security Resolution from um, 242, and the UN Security Resolution from 338, and the General Assembly had consistently repeated that there was a de jure applicability of the Fourth Geneva Convention to consider the occupied Palestinian territories uh, 
um, uh, under belligerent occupation. And more, and this is more important now, the International Court of Justice that I just mentioned in its advisory opinion from 2004 has authoritatively affirmed that um, the convention, the Geneva Convention, applies to all cases of declared war or of any other armed conflict which may arise between two or more high contracting parties. And once these conditions are met, the ICJ stated, and this becomes even more relevant for our, our conversation, uh, that the Geneva Convention, the fourth Geneva Convention, is deemed to apply in any territory occupied, and I quote, in the course of the conflict by one of the contracting parties. And this means that the uh, Palestinian territory does not belong to, to a state, but it, uh, and can on, not only be challenged factually, but it is in fact um, of no pertinent legal relevance to the applicability of the Geneva Conventions. So um, the occupation would only be deemed to end on the facts of the ground, namely Israel relinqu relinquishing its control over the territory. And domestically politically driven assessments cannot be used to undermine clear objective international legal uh, rules. So to this very end, Palestine is occupied. Fourth Geneva Convention applies. And not only that, as I said earlier, um, you know, to echo what the ICJ said in this 2004 um, advisory opinion, because Israel signed also other human rights treaties and other legal treaties, um, their obligation extends to occupying territory. There's an extraterritorial obligation towards the Palestinian people. As simple as that, okay? So there is a clear international legal obligation towards the Palestinian people. However, Israel has always found a loophole to explain something under necessity to transfer its people, and perhaps the Western will talk about that in more detail, to transfer its people there. And its driving impetus is the natural resources. And they are not willing to give up their natural resources anytime soon because um they are deriving um uh, i think Westham wrote about this himself three billion us dollars from um uh, uh, uh annex c of the west bank three billion us dollars i mean imagine that i mean they are not relinquishing any control they want because their driving impetus is the capitalist exploitation of the occupied territories and they will take as much as possible in order to squeeze out every little cent out of the Palestinians. The, uh, the, <clears throat> I think, yeah, so I want to kind of put down two stakes. Um, one's a affirmative statement, one's a question. This will be for Wesson. But if you, if you, and I agree with you, find or, or essentially come to the conclusion that, that Palestine is being occupied by Israel, which is a fairly, which I think we have discussed in some ways, it's a no-brainer, but and you have to find loopholes and do a lot of legal gymnastics to try to get out of this. If it is occupied, then we can go to a whole set of other international legal principles that says, in situations of both occupation and apartheid, which I think is important to discuss, the right to resist it, even in armed struggle, is is sacrosanct. You can you can you can fight against colonial oppression and apartheid di differentiation via armed struggle and it not be illegitimate in terms of your right there's the distinction in ihl of use ad bellum the use in war and use in bellum right but like before what are, what are the rules that get you into war what is the legitimate reason to get into war and these justifications for war and i think it, in terms of international perspective now you can engage in hostilities at any time with your occupying power and i want to say that as a way to kind of immediately undercut the 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 both sides ism or the notion that like uh, one thing you'll hear a lot in the United States is well if Hamas didn't fire rockets then Israel wouldn't respond you'll hear that a lot and I and like that leads me to my kind of second question this is this is for uh, Wesson because obviously this is this is like going on where you are I think it's important to understand why the conflicts uh are in one sense persistent and in some ways erupt, right? There, there are these kind of two things that happen at the same time. There's an ongoing politi social, political, economic uh, 
and military dynamic that happens in in the West Bank and in Gaza. And there's and then there's like these eruptions of like um, you know kinetic, you might say, engagements where you're actually shooting bullets and things like that. Now there's a lot of bullets being fired at children playing and, and problematic aspects that we can talk about in terms of the maintenance of the violent, the understanding that violence is is always right there in terms of the in terms of you know if you're a Palestinian. But it's this um, what makes it the settler colonial type in terms of what Israel is doing, right? There's this notion, at least you can, in principle, abstractly think, look, if we were to say, let's keep at the borders that we've that we've decided, whether that's 1967 or some part of Oslo, which I think if, if you look at this, the amount of territory that Palestine has decreases with every map that's redrawn. So let's, but in principle, let's say that there are defined borders. And if there was no encroachment beyond those borders, I, I want to say one, two, one, it would still be legitimate for the Palestinian people to launch an, an attack against the Israeli defense forces or military members of the occupying power or their objects or their buildings or anything like that. It would be legitimate to, to do that. But um, it would be, the, the question would, meet, would be to me, what reason would we have to see these eruptions of hot violence if there weren't instances of encroachments onto this idea of territorial integrity? So I think you hear in some ways in the media very quick statements about settlements and things like that. But I, I would be curious to hear a little bit more in terms of how this really works kind of on the ground and what this really looks like in terms of, you know, it, it it's a slow burn. And so it's hard for people to kind of see, right, this isn't this isn't an army marching into in a territory and then claiming, you know, it's not Georgia com- or it's not Russia coming into Georgia or something like that, right? This is this is like piece by piece by piece of these like little encroachments on territory. And I'm kind of curious in terms of just to kind of describe a little bit about how it's done and what it does to the sort of integrity, solidarity, and psychology of the Palestinian people for whom this is being done too. Well, I mean, Kevin, it all falls into the broader, uh, well-known strategy of colonialism of uh, divide and conquer, um, and uh, and part of the strategy has been the fragmentation of the Palestinian people, the Palestinians in Gaza, Palestinians in uh, Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, in the West Bank, uh, um, the diaspora, refugees. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, Palestinians in uh, historic Palestine in 1948. Uh, this fragmentation has been part of uh, the, the broader colonization of Palestine. Um, but I wanted to push back on uh, your uh, allusion to uh, what it is that Palestinians uh, can do uh, uh, with regard to uh, resisting uh, and uh, that uh, right that is recognized uh, to uh, struggle against colonial domination. Uh, even those rights are uh, um, deemed to be regulated within the confines of uh, the basic principles of international humanitarian law and right principles of humanity, such as distinction and proportionality. And uh, these need to be respected at all times, regardless of what uh, side, uh, uh, what designation one side might want to give uh, to the other, because in the end, uh, if we are putting aside uh, the uh, essence of uh, the humanity behind the the law, then we undermine uh, uh, its uh, its uh, efficacy uh, in, in its totality. Now, the fact that international law regulates the means and methods of the interaction uh, between a colonizer and the colonized, that doesn't uh, and should not obscure the, the fundamentally unjust nature of the existence of the relationship in the first place. Yeah. Um, but there are different uh, tools to address different issues. and. Uh, uh, you know, the issue of the legacy of colonialism and the legacy of slavery, these are uh, issues that we need to address uh, as uh, we uh, hopefully develop as humanity as a whole and how we are going to address them. Um, but the specific tool of international law and its application uh, 
uh, to occupy Palestinian territory that is recognized uh, by the international community applying to uh, the territory occupied in 1967, uh, there are specific uh, um, uh, prohibitions and regulations that apply within that context. And that uh, uh, that is where we see uh, the continuation and, uh, and the persistence of uh, the Israeli colonial ambitions um, and the reaction to those uh, ambitions on a regular basis, whether it's the designation of uh, a piece of land as uh, state land uh, for the development of a new settlement or the demolition of a Palestinian home or the burning down of a uh, Palestinian olive tree. Um, it can be done at a macro level, it can be done at a micro level, but every one of those encroachments uh, uh, is part of the broader continuing process of colonization, and every one of those issues uh, is seen from the Palestinian side as a further fragmentation, exploitation, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, um, annexation of additional uh, territory. And so whether it's uh, de jure recognized as, uh, as annexed territory or de facto uh, annexed territory, uh, um, every step along the process is a further erosion of uh, what the, the international community sees as uh, the occupied territory and uh, the vision uh, for an independent Palestinian state if it is going to be uh, a two-state uh, paradigm that is uh, the ultimate uh, um, resolution. But uh, that isn't uh, uh, for, for me to chime in on. It is more about the application of the law and how uh, it, is, uh, it is being respected or not. And the, the underlying reason for the lack of respect for international law, as Temel alluded to, uh, has a lot to do with the economic benefits that are being reaped by continuing this process. And, you know, the, let's take uh, the issue of Gaza and the disengagement as, a, as an example of how uh, important it is to look at the bigger picture. Uh, if we look at the um, evolution of uh, the so-called peace process in the late 1990s, one of the most significant uh, uh, developments uh, that uh, is very rarely uh, uh, brought into the discussion is the discovery of natural gas in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and this was actually discovered in cooperation uh, 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 between the Palestinians and the British uh, uh, company um, exploring uh, the, off the coast of Gaza. Um, and then all of a sudden, when, uh, when the gas was uh, discovered, the dynamics changed, and uh, and then Israel started to uh, explore uh, uh, natural gas, and then it became clear of the uh, value of uh, those resources therein, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you have uh, a further deterioration of the situation, and uh, the the disengagement has to be seen within that broader process of Israel calculating what interests. Uh, it wants to prioritize and how it wants to manage uh, those uh, broader uh, colonial ambitions, uh, which include the exploitation of Palestinian natural resources, including uh, gas reserves off the coast of the Mediterranean. And so uh, if you look at it uh, from that broader perspective, uh, you can uh, understand that even from a military perspective, maintaining settlements in Gaza while trying to uh, exclusively exploit uh, the gas in the Mediterranean is much more difficult than if you simply remove the settlers from Gaza and control it from the periphery. It's a dynamic uh, in terms of military calculus uh, that, uh, that was taken, in my opinion, and that uh, uh, helps to explain why uh, Israel has maintained this uh, uh, blockade over Gaza um, uh, for the last uh, 15 years and continued uh, um, to, to find ways to justify it because all uh, colonial endeavors find ways to justify their exploitation. And if you look at a parallel in uh, the history of Namibia and the South African occupation of Namibia, uh, 
the exploitation of the diamond mines was a, a central factor in the extension of the occupation of South Africa uh, in Namibia uh, because of private actors um, and uh, and the benefits that they reaped. Obviously, they weren't reaping it alone. They're very, the, the private actors and the state actors are very much uh, interconnected and can't uh, and shouldn't be uh, dismissed. But all of this is, uh, um, you know, to say that Israel sees uh, the, the occupied Palestinian territory as uh, an asset that it wants to uh, control and exploit, and this has been ongoing from the early days of the occupation um, post-1967. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the legal advisor advised uh, that this was in violation of the Geneva Conventions, um, but uh, uh, what ended up happening is uh, the Israeli government uh, facilitated an international investment uh, conference and uh, formed uh, the Israel Corporation, which is, uh, in my opinion, a, a modern day manifestation of the Crown Charter Company. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, even formed the uh, insurance company to provide political risk insurance for uh, the banking and construction sector uh, to mitigate their, their risks and incentivize construction of settlements in occupied territory. And all this, continued to uh, play out. So it was very clear early on that Israel was seeing uh, the acquisition of uh, territory as uh, something uh, uh, that was, uh, uh, it had no intention of, uh, of giving up. And it, on the contrary, it encouraged uh, um, the international uh, community to come and invest and become part of the process, uh, thereby uh, attaching them uh, to that uh, uh, that uh, colonial uh, enterprise, and uh, you've seen uh, over the last uh, 50 years, from the exploitation of uh, land and water of the Jordan Valley to the minerals in the Dead Sea uh, to natural gas in the Mediterranean, um, it's all about control and uh, exploitation and uh, and incentives. And so, when you create this uh, economic incentive structure, uh, which uh, if you look at history, you see that uh, Israel has drawn on a lot of the examples of colonialism in the past. In fact, uh, Herzl uh, is uh, well uh, known to, have, to Cecil Rhodes, uh, who led the British South Africa Company endeavor um, in Southern Africa, uh, that uh, he wanted to replicate the, what Cecil Rhodes was doing, uh, but uh, in, uh, in the Middle East. And so Israel has continued to refine this uh, best business practice of colonialism and attaching uh, uh, its uh, ambitions with the interests of others. Uh, in the US, uh, you have a very strong uh, strategic relationship. Uh, things like the storage of uh, strategic reserve ammunitions, um, the, Israeli, uh, the Israel bonds that are sold uh, around the, uh, the world, but the, um, I think uh, primarily in uh, North America and uh, Western Europe. Um, and even the exploitation and, uh, um, and the challenges uh, uh, that, uh, that we face under occupation, uh, Israel also uh, develops its uh, research and technology um, in uh, its uh, continued oppression of the Palestinian people. And then uh, exports uh, that technology and, and weaponry as field tested to the rest of the world. And you see it used to oppress other peoples as well. And so it is that Palestinian oppression that is affecting the oppression of other peoples in the world that uh, shows the importance and the, the strength of a simple statement that uh, Nelson Mandela made when uh, apartheid uh, was uh, declared to be over, that the uh, people of South Africa would never truly be free until Palestine is free, because there is an interconnected dynamics of peoples and forms of oppression and exploitation, and how allowing it to happen in one part of the world will inherently impact another part of the world. And so this uh, issue is very important to keep in mind, and why it's so important uh, to look at the uh, Israeli exploitation of Palestinian territory and the economic incentives that uh, come along with it uh, that uh, need to be addressed as part of the bigger issue. Otherwise, 
those benefits that are being reaped, Israel will simply see uh, the cost of uh, sporadic or periodic escalations in violence and hostilities as a cost of doing business. And that shouldn't be the way the international community uh, develops its, uh, uh, its way of uh, relations moving forward. If, if I may corroborate, yeah, yep. Kevin, yeah, um, I mean, I mean, Wessam already summed it up perfectly, right? Uh, I think, I mean, three sages, perhaps for the listeners and the viewers, I mean, since 1967, since the occupation, um, uh, the first stage from 1967 to 1977, the occupied territories were temporarily considered as areas administered by Israel until a territorial compromise could be achieved with with jordan and uh during this period where the mapai party led government started the israeli settlement project in eastern jerusalem um since 1967 and then into hebron uh jordan valley etc and then gaza and then nablus and the aim was to create israeli facts on the ground that would influence the division of the territories between israel on the one hand and jordan right and the second stage that then uh, pursued and un, un, um, you know, unleashed uh, was in 1977, um, when the first right-wing government composed of Menachem Begin uh, presented a different position that the West Bank and, and East Jerusalem were part of a great land of Israel and were not only solely administered, as it was said pre previously, and um, they uh, aimed of annexing Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, southern hills of Hebron, Jordan Valley, and Israel. Um, and this then, you know, uh, continued uh, where, uh, you know, there was a growing uh, resistance among uh, the Palestinian people. Um, and we are currently, and, you know, I don't want to, you know, talk and talk on, uh, but we are currently looking at the third stage of the development of Israel politics towards the Palestinians, uh, a third negative state, if you wish, um, taken forward by Netanyahu governments beginning in 2009 until today, and this can be uh, uh, considered as a, as, a, as, a, as a stage where the priority of peace with the Palestinians is sidelines for the sake of a separate agenda, and this agenda can be seen as a range from to keeping the occupied Palestinian territories in the hands of the Israelis for security reasons, and those who want to keep it in the hands of the Israelis based on uh, historical and, and ideological um, gains. And if I may you know, continue and, and finish off, uh, John Kerry, the former Secretary of State under, under Barack Obama, said uh, in face of the Israeli policies of the expansion of settlements, uh, he said, let's be clear, settlement expansion has nothing to do with Israel's security. Many settlements actually increase the security burden on the Israeli defense forces, and leaders for the settlement movements are motivated by ideological imperatives that entirely ignore legitimate Palestinian aspirations. So, you know, what, and this ties into what, what you know, Wesson says. I mean, what we are seeing is this larger expansion of Israel on the expenses of Palestinians and the eruption that we are seeing today uh, in, and in the fa past few days, I think this is the seventh day into the very violent situation in Palestine, is you know based on you know the developments in Sheikh Jarrah in the uh, Jerusalem neighborhood, which was another attempt um, through legitimization to the Israeli judiciary um, to reinterpret international law for the favor of an Israeli all ethnic state for the Jewish population. And that is where we have to start to fight back and we have to see resistance on all fronts. So uh, turning back, I guess, a little bit to, to IHL to kind of bring this, bring out some of these things. I, I am curious, Wesson, on your perspective on this sort of as a Palestinian in, in a Palestinian area, right? I think it's important to understand too that right now as part of that divide and conquer strategy that you were talking about, there are two governmental bodies in Palestine. Palestine is in some ways separated into two areas. There is Gaza and the West Bank. There are different political 
organizations they're 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 with. There's obviously um, Hamas in in Gaza and the Palestinian Authority um, in the West Bank, and they have different relationships to to Israel. Um, and obviously, I mean, I think it goes without saying that Hamas's relationship is much less um, much less conciliatory, if we can put it in that kind of uh, like that way, I guess. Um, we cannot call it even a relationship, perhaps. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's it's in, in conflict, I suppose. But the um, the the there, I can see a frustration. This okay. So I'll plant my flag in this in some ways of saying I think the conclusion that I will I will almost always bear to the question of Israel Palestine is that I don't think there will ever be a solution to this conflict until such time as the uh, as the essentially the working classes of both of those areas recognize the commonality they have together uh, and fight against their their um, unified exploiters, um, which are being taken advantage of them both in Israel and in Palestine and in some ways know each other and work like th- there's a, a dynamic there that is unhealthy, I think, in some sense, in terms of the elites of both organ- of, of both. Um, sort of societies, if you would call them that. But I, so I think um, th- that's kind of where I plant the flag in terms of my sort of Marxian perspective on the actual solution to this conflict. I don't think even militarily this will continue on almost indefinitely because the, like because of a lot of different dynamics. And so, but the frustrating thing for me is is that I think you were totally right, Weston, to kind of make sure that we recognize that while there is this kind of use in Bellum understanding that if you're fighting against an apartheid or colonial regime, your resistance is, is legal in some ways. It's, it's justified. But that the laws still apply to you, meaning, this is the frustration I have, I am absolutely in favor of resistance against settler colonialism generally and certainly in Palestine. The means by which that is resisted to me is a constant source of frustration, both from the Palestinian Authority side and from the from um, from Hamas, because I understand wanting to respond militarily to this continued encroachment, then the then the the shame because there is this kind of honor culture aspect that we need to understand too of what happened in Alaska and all of that coming in together to orchestrate the desire for so there to be some kind of like hit him where it hurts desire, like desire for a response. The, the relatively unguided nature of the, of the rockets that are being fired from Gaza, the inability to genuinely direct them only specifically at military targets, the essential wholesale inability to, sufficiently ab- ab- like uh, oblige yourself of the actual rules of IHL make what is an understandable desire for resistance ultimately unjustifiable for its fact that it's killing civilians and it's not it's not necessarily targeting civilians but it's not taking the due care necessary to prevent civilian casualties and so it is it is it is non-legitimate in terms of the form in which the response is taking. The response is legitimate, but the form is not. That's really frustrating for me because the response is necessary, but it's a bad response. It's a response that's facilitating justifications from the opposite side, from the Israeli side. That look, it's just, they're just launch, they're just attacking civilians like willy nilly. We need to do something about it, and so. I'm just curious about that perspective you have a bit with some. I mean, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of, in some ways, political and ideological differences with Hamas in terms of how they understand politics and economics and and the role of the military. And I think their ability to oblige or their desire to oblige with the rules of IHL that I think they would want to apply to Israel, but maybe not so much to themselves. Um, and so it's it just I I sit in a kind of constant form of frustration because I get when people say like, well, they shouldn't be launching rockets just randomly into Tel Aviv and, and having to say like, yes, I I actually agree with that. They probably shouldn't just be lobbying rockets into Tel Aviv, but then having to go on the other side and saying, but again, we must bring in the obligations of international humanitarian law to Israel in terms of, as you've discussed, Tamil, it's proportionality specifically uh, it's care that it's taking to avoid civilian casualties. Cause I think, and we can get into this, but I think Israel does 
just enough of like letting people know and calling people beforehand and doing this kind of stuff so that they can point to all of these, look at all the care we take to avoid civilian casualties, but yet civilian casualties continue to mount in ways that a small precision guided munition would not necessarily produce. And I know, we all know that Israel has those small laser infrared and GPS guided munitions. If it can do a building knock where it can do a, it can hit a building with a munition that isn't live to let everyone know that it's going to, it can do something a little less necessary than blowing up the fucking building. So like, <laughs> like it's, that's the frustrating thing that I have. So, there's two questions in there. One, the 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 response that Ham, the, the the actual uh, military response that Hamas decides to engage in in terms of these unguided rocket attacks, and the the sort of illegitimacy of the means and methods that Israel does in terms of its response. So, Wes, I'm curious to hear about your frustrations or lack thereof with Hamas. I think part of the problem is trying to isolate the, the Palestinian uh, uh, people into the, the different components and the different parties and the different factions and uh, uh, trying to examine how each one is uh, uh, responding to the continued occupation, exploitation, and, uh, and colonial ambitions. And uh, this is, again, part of that divide and conquer strategy to try to isolate how each uh, uh, separate uh, component within the Palestinian struggle is, uh, is responding and, and, and uh, put the, the spotlight uh, on that, uh, losing sight of the, the forest for the trees. I'm not saying that uh, you're trying to do that, Kevin. I just want to make sure that uh, I uh, stress that point. Now, I appreciate your frustration in trying to address it. Uh, imagine the frustration of the people living under occupation, living under a colonial regime, and trying to resist it especially when it is clear that that uh, regime has no intention of uh, uh, giving them uh, their, uh, their freedom or allowing them to uh, live in dignity um, and enjoy their right to self-determination. Uh, but with regard to uh, the uh, application and respect uh, for international law, uh, you're right uh, that there w there's a lot of division within uh, Palestinian uh, uh, leadership, uh, and uh, uh, part of that is uh, um, internal, part of that uh, is external, because uh, if uh, Israel is able to uh, keep Palestinians divided, it is able to constantly use it as an excuse uh, for its policies. And uh, there are no doubt various interests at play uh, uh, that are pulling and pushing uh, the, the different parties. Uh, but one of the key uh, uh, factors uh, that I want to point to as, a, as an example of Palestinian unity was um, uh, a general universal acceptance by the various Palestinian parties uh, to move forward towards the International Criminal Court. And that uh, was an affirmation of the faith uh, that uh, exists within uh, the Palestinian people in international law and its ability uh, to help in uh, delivering on what it says. And that was done with an, a recognition that the jurisdiction of the court would apply uh, to Israeli actions and Palestinian actions. But this is where, again, Palestine becomes the test. Is the law going to be applied universally to those with the power and those that are resisting against colonialism and oppression? Or is it going to be continuing uh, as, a, as a tool uh, of, uh, of uh, further uh, um, exploitation and uh, and simply a, a more uh, advanced means and method of uh, uh, of maintaining uh, inequality and uh, and exploitation. This is where I think uh, the International Criminal Court is going to send a very uh, strong message of uh, whether or not uh, the faith uh, in, uh, uh, that has been placed in international law has been uh, misguided or not. <laughs> 
Can I come on this, Kevin? Yep. Um, so, uh, so I mean, as parties to the conflict, um, Hamas and Palestinian armed groups have an obligation to abide by international humanitarian law. I think um, we have established that. Uh, like, Israel has to oblige. Um, and I, I understand where you're coming from and your arguments there. Um, so to this very end, you know, the targeting of military installations and, and other objectives, military objectives, um, I, I would like to emphasize is permitted. Uh, and that is, you know, part of uh, international humanitarian law. Uh, and uh, to this end, Hamas must take all precautions to avoid civilian harm. Um, and it's uh, prohibited from targeting civilians or launching indiscriminate attacks or attacks that would cause in, uh, disproportionate harm uh, to civilians compared to expected military advantage. That is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, necessity, proportionality, etc. Um, all of those uh, uh, military IHL principles are, you know, uh, part of this. The Hamas commanders must choose to this end means that direct the targets, military targets, and minimize incidental harms to civilians. And uh, what we know for now is that Hamas is using some croissant rockets or uh, more advanced rockets from the Russian design, the Grab rockets, uh, which are considered to be more inaccurate um, and incapable uh, to really distinguish between military targets and civilian objects, um, at least when they are targeted at pop uh, populated areas. And uh, what we know is that Hamas is firing um, those rockets out of Ga the Gaza Strip towards Israel. And uh, if those rockets target uh, um, civilian areas, it is a violation of international humanitarian law because it's an, it's an deliberate and indiscriminate attack. It doesn't really distinguish anymore as one of the principles of international humanitarian law. Um, and it makes civilians vulnerable to counterattacks. And um, there is a, a strong requirement to take all the feasible precautions to protect civilians. Um, having said that, uh, I mean, Israel. I think I just read it today. I mean, in the in the in the in the build up to our today's interview, I read on the Haaretz, uh, the famous Israeli newspaper. I read that in 2014. Okay, in the article of 2014, it it, it said that Israel had received cumulatively. 100 billion US dollars in military transfer solely. So that's the reason why they have this, you know, military shield mm -hmm. um, that they have established, which as we have heard in the previous days that, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, destroyed the rockets that were fired um, uh, towards the um, populated areas, which, you know, still doesn't um, relinquish any obligation on, on Hamas as, a, as an actor in this conflict uh, to abide by IHL. Um, however, you know, um, I would like to shift our focus also on Israel. Um, this recent bombardment that I mentioned earlier of uh, the Al Jazeera or the building that hosted Al Jazeera and uh, Associated Press. Um, I think the, the, the CEO of the Associated Press said yesterday, uh, he still needs evidence that Hamas was in the building. Okay, that Hamas was in the building, and that, like, when I was watching the the, the interview of the of the CEO of Associated Press from New York, I had to immediately think of the bombardment um, of uh, of Belgrade in 1999, when um, you know a radio television center was uh, bombarded by the Western powers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is. What what is the violation there, uh, as well? You know, Israel is violating. Israel is fully aware where they. I mean, Israel has a mostly sophisticated, probably military equipment in the world, right? From receiving so many military equipments from Germany, Britain, uh, and the U.S. and from other countries, they know who they are targeting. And just yesterday, it was heartbreaking to see. And you are a father yourself, Kevin. 10 people from the same family died, eight little children. 
died in the Gaza Strip. So my question is, you know, if we are, and I understand the frustration towards Hamas. I do. I do. Really, I do. Um, but we should also look at the most sophisticated, perhaps, military in the world, and that is Israel at the moment, in my eyes, and their obligations as well. Yes, uh, like so. That's that is, I think, exactly like the the thing I wanted to rest on too was that you have. I think Alexandria Casio said has said this too in Congress that there's what you have in in the Israeli Palestinian dynamic is a significant imbalance of power, where the Israelis are just so much more militarily powerful than the uh, you know Hamas in particular. Um, and certainly even, you know, the, the other less organized fighting groups in Gaza. And so it, its ability to be proportional, to be particular, to avoid civilian casualties, to do all these kinds of things is extremely, extremely high. And the frustration that I have, and I, I'd be curious what you guys' is, is perspective on this is, is that we'll hear every now and then of these knock building knocks and then calls to buildings and certain things that that appear to be this attempt to minimize civilian casualties. Um, so it is obviously possible that that Israel can do that. It, it is possible for it to do so. But I, it, it appears to me, obviously, not being able to access the information, I'm not even sure who would be able to access this information, um, the legitimacy of each target, right? In principle, before any sortie that goes out by airplanes, they're going to have particular targets. Those targets are going to be GPS identified. And there ought to be, at least somewhere in the annals of the IDF, a justification under international humanitarian law for hitting those. I would love to see those documents because I would be very curious to who, at who is making those decisions and on what grounds they believe that they are legitimate targets, they are necessary targets, and the amount of force that's being brought upon them is is proportional to the the attacks that are coming from them. I think when you do have the Iron Dome and other things that are significantly minimizing the actual like consequences of rockets fired from a random, potentially random apartment building in um, in Gaza, whether or not it is, uh, is militarily ne- necessary to destroy the entire building and to make homeless everyone who lived there. And I think it's it's almost com- obvious to me, both with Israelis, not only Israeli Israel's capabilities in terms of weapons fired from the air, but they're, even their ground capability and their commando capability and things like that. I mean, Israel could paratroop, paratroopers on top of a building, clear it and pick them up with a helicopter with running not running run much risk of being, you know, taken down. So it's like, again, I just, it, it, it is from the IHL perspective that I come from, it's just none of this seems justified like at all. And we're seeing the consequences of it. And um, while, yes, I think that the ability to take care in terms of Hamas's ability to do that is lower, meaning it's it maybe can make some kind of argument that we were at least moving these in the general direction and, and having these at a certain angle that we knew if it was firing at a certain point, it should land around a barracks or something like that. Maybe you could make those claims. But I don't see how Israel can make the, the same kind of claim when it destroys an obviously uh, civilian object that may have, for a period of time, been used as a military target. But again, even under IHL, if you want to get into the weeds, it's only when it's con- when it's being actively used as a military target does an otherwise civilian object become an, 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 a legitimate military target. So unless there are rocket launchers on top of that apartment building the moment it gets hit, it's no longer a legitimate target. And so... The well, so I will say while I have frustrations with Hamas and and the techniques that they engage in, my frustration with Israel is orders of magnitude higher simply for its ability to be able to do those things and its complete at least from my perspective lack of interest in doing so and and I think this is where I want to get to in terms of even what you were saying uh, with some is the ICC part of this right is that. For those you know that may not be again as in the weeds on this, there is an ongoing investigation by the International Criminal Court. There have been argumentation of all of the different aspects of this conflict at the International C- Criminal Court, whether or not Palestine is sufficiently a state, whether or not a situation of occupation is is there, whether or not parties to the conflict are subject to IHL. All of these different things have been, at, even as recently as January, settled 
the it the ICC has jurisdiction. It can investigate these kinds of things, and there, in some ways, we should be seeing the opening of prosecutions that would hopefully at least add some lack of impunity for doing these kinds of things. But I just would echo echo what you said. Is it going to happen? Can the ICC really do this? I was, when I was studying international humanitarian law, very wide-eyed and bushy-tailed about the idea of the ICC. I thought, man, this is really an important thing. And, and I was even of the argument, like to your point, Wes, well, it's like, well, you know, one of the cool things about the ICC was that almost all, I think everybody in Africa joined, which was really good for Africa in the sense of like wanting to be subject to this and saying, yes, we, we you know, uh, agree to it. And obviously it was, a, it was a disaster that the U.S. played such a huge role in the preparation of the Rome Statutes and then decides, yeah, we'll sign and then bring it to our nonsensical governmental bodies and see if they're going to decide, which of course they didn't, right? And then you don't, when you don't have... Russia and you don't have India and you don't have China, you know, the people who are engaged in armed conflicts in areas in the world and potentially committing war crimes. And obviously Israel and other places are not members. And so I think it is interesting and it is it is important, as you mentioned, to say that the Palestinians want it to be. And not only for the sense of like trying to have some kind of like stab back at Israel. They're willing to subject themselves to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, which means in in principle, there are some uh, um, Hamas military commanders and even Hamas pol- pol- political commanders potentially who are subject to, to indictment by the ICC. This is, in principle, good. This is a good thing. I think that there it, it's a kind of truism that when there are war, there are war crimes. But I think particularly in Israel and Palestine, we are seeing relatively obviously on a daily basis the commission of war crimes, and I think even arguably crimes against humanity. This is a particularly ongoing attack against a civilian population, and there are individual crimes being committed as part of that ongoing attack. And so, at least under the Rome Statutes, you have a potential justification for a crime against humanity on, on Israel. The, the question will really be, is the court in the position to be able to do that? And I wonder what you guys maybe as you know as we come on to almost 2 hours which god we could talk about this for i could talk about this for a long time um but where you guys kind of see i mean you know Wesom, you you said like this will be the challenge for the ICC all right yep it is definitely the challenge do you think it's do you think it's up to it where where do you where do you stake your claim uh i refer to myself as a uh a realistic uh, uh, idealist, uh, and so I am hopeful, um, but I'm not holding my breath, um, just simply because I've been doing this work for, for uh, now uh, almost uh, 16 years, um, and we have seen uh, different uh, opportunities for the international mechanisms that have been created to address and hold Israel accountable um, and been uh, constantly disappointed. And so I think it would be naive, uh, no matter uh, what uh, the law might say uh, now, uh, that uh, uh, for us to expect uh, you know, to be overly optimistic because it continues to be uh, part of an international system. Um, but... Uh, the tools available are the tools we have to use, and either uh, we don't uh, engage with them, and then they have an excuse uh, for not addressing the issue, or we engage with them and they either address it, or they expose uh, themselves as uh, uh, not being uh, what they're uh, they're put out to be. And so uh, this is our challenge: uh, is to use the pen. Since we don't have the sword, and uh, and uh, and force uh, the the spirit of the law to work, um, uh, I know uh, for me it's been a great uh, discussion, and uh, I look forward to more uh, because I think uh, there is a lot uh, that can be discussed. Uh, but I I want to conclude before giving Temple the the final word uh, to just 
put the, uh, your viewers in a again the sort of uh, macro and uh, 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 micro uh, connection. Um, uh, Tamil, you uh, definitely connected the developments in Sheikh Jarrah to the deterioration of the situation. I also wanted to add another dimension of understanding of, uh, of uh, the what I refer to as the, the corporate catalyst. Uh, a Delaware registered company, uh, Nahalat Shimon, uh, is a, a real estate uh, actor uh, registered in Delaware uh, that uh, uh, played an instrumental role in pushing the situation in Sheikh Jarrah uh, to uh, uh, to the precipice uh, that uh, that it reached, and uh, uh, the the way it's been described by Israel is very telling as well. Uh, trying to portray the situation as merely being a, a real estate dispute. Um, and this is sort of the way colonial actors have dealt with the colonized territory, using the law to detach the people from their connection to the land and call it uh, as uh, uh, development of, uh, of the law. And so uh, um, how the law is used is uh, very telling in the, the power balance as well. And for me, studying the historical use of corporations and the uh, colonization of Palestine, I see uh, this uh, specific incident as really just a microcosm of how uh, different uh, business interests have played a, uh, a historical role in the colonization of, uh, of Palestine along business lines. And uh, this uh, example in Sheikh Jarrah is just uh, uh, one of those uh, examples. Um, at a macro level, uh, this decade, 2021 to 2030, is the fourth international decade for the eradication of colonialism. If you thought colonialism was over, we're in the fourth international decade for the eradication of colonialism. And so you have a colonial past, you have a colonial present. We need to address these if we are going to move forward to uh, a better future. Unfortunately, this initiative, uh, only three states formally voted against uh, the initiative of the fourth international decade for the eradication of colonialism. I could let your viewers guess who those three states were, uh, but uh, I'll uh, uh, I'll stop uh, uh, with the with the, uh, with attention and uh, uh, put them out there. Uh, but I, I'm sure I've given them some time to think. Mm -hmm. uh, those three states are the U.S., the U.K., and Israel. And so these dots between the macro level and the micro level are the dots that need to be connected by your listeners to think about uh, what is happening in Palestine and see it within the broader context of global dynamics and, more importantly, what role they can do uh, within that context. Thank you, Kevin. If, if, I, I, I mean, Wessam already brilliantly put it, and he gave us this historical and, and you know, on the ground experience being a Ramallah um, in Palestine. So, um, I mean, following up on what he said, and I also cannot believe it's two hours already. I, I, I could really talk for hours and hours to come. And I think it's getting late for, for both of you, especially for Wesson, because he has uh, ha he has been touched upon uh, the morning because earlier than than we did, um, but uh, uh, I mean touching upon the ICC that he just mentioned. Um, how did you call yourself, Wesson? Realist optimist, optimistic realist, or uh, a realistic idealist? A realistic idealist. Okay, so. Uh, Probably, if, if I look at the ICC, Kevin, and you have also your overlappings and your historical background to, towards the ICC, I'm, I'm a, a pessimistic realist towards the ICC, okay? Uh, <laughs> I, um, I, I, the ICC obviously has you know, generated much of its, 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 its power, its, its inspiration by you know, joining of forces from the Global South. Uh, you know, think of Africa in particular that you mentioned earlier. Um, but we have seen also in the last, I don't know, uh, how many years is it now? 20, 20 years or so. 
um, that uh, uh, the ICC had failed towards the needs of the global south and the formerly colonized peoples. And we have seen this all in particular in relation to war crimes committed in Afghanistan and in Iraq by the US and the UK. I found it quite encouraging that the office of the prosecutor is considering um, what is happening in Palestine. Um, I'm not sure how it will fall, move forward. If there will be some political narratives uh, and some forces that will play a role um, also towards the new uh, incoming prosecutor um, to impede any forms of prosecution. I don't know. I cannot tell, really. Um, I don't have the crystal ball and uh, I'm not the Oracle of Delphi. But what I can say is the ICC has um, been used quite often as a Trojan horse for furthering um, a Western hegemony, in particular uh, in, in Africa. So um, I, I see it quite, you know, I, on a pessimistic, realistic sense, if you wish. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, I would like to see some improvements um, and Palestine should be the kicking start of all of it. Let's see what will happen in the next weeks or months or years to come. Uh, but altogether, uh, I'm pretty sure, um, and let me end with this sentence, perhaps, uh, as we are closing on two hours, um, Palestine will be free. Um, colonialism will end and dignity will be uh, restored for everybody. That is my um, strong hope. There's your, there's your idealism coming back right there. <laughs> like I was going to say, because I, I would consider myself like an idealistic skeptic, skeptic in the sense that I, I still very much think that there is a huge amount of promise in what the ICC does as this kind of desire for a personal enforcement mechanism and this kind of ending of like individual impunity, which I think is important to at least leverage the decision making that's going to happen by actors in large state apparatuses. But I do think a state apparatus can in many ways have a life of its own and does have a lot of economic interests that warp its desire that even the risk that a person might be under in terms of the ICC may be outweighed by the other interests that it must take into account as part of its bureaucratic role and things like that. And so, yeah, I just, I was very, again, very idealistic about the possibility of the ICC was very intent on watching it develop. And, and, and I think the Rome statutes are, are a very positive resuscitation of important laying out of like crimes and things like that. And important to kind of make sure in some ways, just to know that like, we talk very specifically about like what is and isn't a genocide and a crime against humanity, just so that we know that we're capturing the really horrors that other people can do to each other. There's a lot of great possibility in it, but in terms of the expression of what the court is actually doing, it reminds me a lot of something like the Declaration of Independence, where you read it and it sounds, wow, sounds great. And then you look at like where the place is that it, that, that document is being written and there's an entire race of people held in chattel slavery. And you, you kind of immediately are dis disappointed by the fact that the high ideals that are represented in the words of the document are not expressed in the actual uh, society or institutions that are that develop. And I think the ICC is unfortunately yet another example of, as we've discussed, the inability to live high ideals in an otherwise economic, you know, social, economic, and political situation, which does not have does not share those high ideals. When the point of our economy is to make money above other all things, and the point of our international relations is to have power enough to not have laws apply to you, and if the you know if the reason that you engage with other countries is merely your what benefit you can get out of it, and the justification for all your actions are simply what serves your self interest, these this is not an environment that is going to foster the living out of our high ideals. And so we are unfortunately in this situation, and I think it's it's always been ironic to me when I read the International Covenant on Social, Economic, and, and uh, Cultural Rights and things like that about some of the high ideals that are embodied in international human rights treaties and in the ICC and stuff like that, but how obviously incapable we are of realizing those in the current economic and political paradigm. And so for me, the the kind of learning about human rights and being a sort of human rights lawyer and things like that forces me to come back into the reason I made this podcast and to be able to kind of educate and and connect threads about how 
we are never going to officially really deal with I even think settler colonialism and and racism and and all of these other kind of social and economic and geographical you know, climate change all of these major ills that we that we see we are never going to be able to address unless we as I said before even come together the kind of large mass of working class people recognize how bad the interests and incentives are of the people who rule over us and exploit us and expropriate them from their ability to continue to do so, that, so that we can genuinely live our high ideals. And so that's why for me, I you know made this podcast and want to express those ideas to, to other people. And I am significantly in both of your debt. I know Wesson, it's getting late. And Tamla, you, you suggested Wesson come on. And I, I think it's just amazing. One, Wesson, you're there. You, you know what's going on. You have this perspective that gives you that gives you an insight in a, in a way to see what's going on that connects the thirty thousand feet to the ground level, and I think it's really important to listen to people like you and and even Tamil. I think you've got a great perspective, and we're played the role of professor a bit to make sure that we understood that. Oh yeah, there's the Geneva Conventions that we have to make sure that we talk about all that. But I th- so that I think it worked really well, and and so Wes, I'm just curious. Um, t- tell us a little bit about what you're doing in terms of your work and how people can, can get uh, that information. Cause I want to make sure that gets out there. I think it's very important if I may say to, to stress him the work of Al Haq down in, in Palestine. Uh, well, I mean, uh, really, as they say, you can just uh, follow our work <laughs> really on our website and, uh, and social media and, uh, unfortunately, uh, these days, uh, there's a lot of, uh, trying to, uh, to put out fires and uh, and react and respond and this kind of rapid response work is very draining on uh, uh, all human rights advocates uh, wherever they are in the world. Um, uh, uh, we see it uh, now uh, coming uh, back. As I said, I've seen this cycle uh, uh, on numerous occasions. Um, but uh, it's again incumbent also upon us to look back and see what was done in the past, why it didn't work and try to figure out new ways uh, to uh, to challenge it. Because as Einstein said, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. And so I think uh, part of uh, uh, what is happening really around the world and, and the awakening uh, of, of people to the situation in Palestine from a different perspective is this kind of reconciliation process that is going on, uh, especially after coming out of a pandemic and seeing how a virus that starts in Wuhan leads to uh, half a million deaths in the U.S. We are an interconnected people, uh, uh, more and more so. We should see uh, how interconnected we are, not just from the perspective of uh, health and human services, but uh, for humanity as a whole, climate change and colonialism. uh, All these things need to be addressed in a holistic manner. And the people uh, that want to do something can find uh, something to do. Um, but uh, it's important to look at this kind of fragmentation uh, uh, in, the, in, in the mindset of people seeing uh, this issue being political, this is economic, this is cultural, as if uh, uh, we uh, um, live in isolation in these components. They're very much interconnected. We have to see those interconnections and figure out what we can do within the means that we have within the broader system. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right, you guys, I'll let you go. I know it's getting late. I really appreciate you talking to me, and uh, obviously things are developing on the ground. Wes, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're likely busy and frustrated and all that good jazz, so appreciate the couple hours, and uh, let's be in touch and, and keep uh, keep talking about this. No problem. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And, and the talking is also uh, part uh, uh, partly therapeutic. Uh, so I appreciate the, the opportunity. Sure. Keep up the good work. Thank Thanks for the invitation, Kevin. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Thanks for listening to this episode of the Sensible Socialist Podcast. This podcast is supported by listeners like you. No advertisements or anything will ever be said. If you want to support the podcast, please go to patreon.com slash sensiblesocialist and give today.
Also, please give us a review or a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast, as it greatly helps. All right. See you next time.